Welcome, everyone, to the Classical Philosophy Podcast. With me again is Chris, up in Norwich. Today we'll discuss Il Principe, The Prince, by Niccolo Machiavelli. And the book was written, am I right, to Lorenzo de' Medici, who was the Principe, the Prince of Florence at the time. And let me just say for now briefly that the book, there's a rumor, this might be a total legend, but if it isn't, and it makes it all the more fascinating, that the book was actually not supposed to be published, that it was just a text written for the Medici so that he could use it as a, as a, a script to how, on how to rule ruthlessly and without falling for any kind of idealistic version of or idea suggestions for um, for government. But what Machiavelli does here is he gathers all kinds of uh, various nefarious methods to maintain power and he gives very clear guidelines on how to come to power, how to hold power. It's an extreme, um, you know, it shows us uh, very extremely, uh, an early will to power, perhaps. And the idea then is that this book is esoteric. It wasn't meant for the public. It was leaked, one could say, to the public. And perhaps this is why he was exiled. So this is an esoteric work, I will read it as such, which was written for one man's eyes and one man's eyes only. And it was written in such a way that this man could maintain power, but also not just for himself, but also to recognize who he's dealing with in terms of power relations. Is the other party, the other prince, the other king, did he come to power because it was given to him by the people? Did he come to power because he took it? What kind of, so how weak, or how strong is my opponent or my partner, my uh, competitor, etc.? So this is what uh, I'd like to begin with. And then I'll say a bit more on, on, on history in, in general in a bit. But Chris, what are your initial thoughts? Um. Yeah, I, I, I like the, the Nietzsche. I'm not, I'm, we're probably gonna, we might disagree on just how, how much this is a kind of will to power. Um, but I, I think Nietzsche is a very, is a relevant um, figure to read um, Machiavelli alongside. Um, I think, I mean, some of, the, some of the things that, just my first impressions on reading this book, I read it probably 10 years ago and um, haven't read it uh, for a long time, one of the my first impressions was how just how Aristotelian it was. I was I've read a lot of Aristotle since I've read that book, and I was just really struck by the style of it. I mean, the first chapter um, is titled "How Many Kinds of Principalities There Are, and for What Means They Are Required." And to anyone who's read Aristotle, that's just a very Aristotelian chapter, right? It's a, this is a scientific inquiry. Um, He's doing it and he's going to do it very methodically and very dispassionately. So that was one of the things that struck me. Um, the other is, yeah, coming back to Nietzsche, this is a very, um, very, there's, a, there's an opposition between Machiavelli's style of politics and the Christian style of politics that um, maybe he's writing against. Um, and Thirdly, I think that just we need to talk about the two, the two key concepts um, in this book is our ability and fortune on the one hand. How much does fortune affect um, a, a, the way that things run in a state, how things go, whether things go well or badly, and how far can ability of an individual actually sway things themselves? Okay, um, so ability and fortune, maybe you can say a bit more about that in a bit. He's, so in terms of what, what he's writing, I think he's right, he's, it's, it's a specific 
um, history. And he's writing a history on, in a sense, to come comment it from, from, from Schelling. He's not a historian in the antiqu so Schelling and Nietzsche in one. He's not a historian in an antiquarian sense, so he doesn't care about all the, the details of every single thing. He's not writing a universal history either. He's writing something very specific for history that brings something to the fore and brings something, it actually carves out a certain form that maybe hadn't been done before in that sense, in that, in that way, which is to focus solely on the prince or the king as the bearer of power and how power can be maintained. And he looks at different examples from history to do so. And also, interestingly, on, on some of the you know, prophets and really strike extremely important uh, founders of cities, like Romulus is one of the figures he focuses on, and Moses, of course, as uh, Moses freed uh, the Jews from, from Egypt and guided them to, towards Israel. And so I think that the, the, that's perhaps one of the, the reasons why the book's fascinating is that it, it carves out just this one aspect really well. And yeah, but let's talk about ability and fortune. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, we're constantly um, presented with this, this concept, with this term virtue, or um, the Italian virtu, um, V-I-R-T-U, um, mm. which, which we need to, it doesn't translate as virtue, which is why it's sometimes useful just to use the Italian word, even though I sound a little silly when I do so. Um, but it's not, and this is relevant because what I was saying before, this isn't what Machiavelli is doing is, is in some sense opposing the Christian um, idea of um, what a ruler should be, um, which is why the term virtue is, is a difficult one to use. And just like, as I say, Nietzsche uses the word virtue in, in books like The Genealogy and Zarathustra, and he wants to reclaim that word from the Christian interpretation of it. Um, I think Machiavelli is doing a similar thing, obviously many hundreds of years earlier. Um, what Machiavelli considers virtuous is creating a, a conditions in a country which of stability. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. and order yeah um, if if those conditions hold then whatever it takes to create those conditions is he will consider virtuous <laughs> um, so it, it goes against this christian idea of virtuous in yeah. terms of uh, certain acts so and certain what we would call virtues so um benevolence kindness uh, mercy is a big one for machiavelli yeah. you know he'll say things like Okay, it's all very nice to be to be merciful. But what happens if that, if being merciful, uh, creates a rebellion and or weakens a state such that it it could be invaded by um, an outsider? In in which case, what you've done is many hundreds of people will be slaughtered because of this invasion. Um, so what we thought was a virtue in being merciful actually has turned out to be um quite the opposite <laughs> yeah and uh, the other one in terms of fortune yeah. um he's um so there's a quote in chapter 25 oh, sorry. sorry 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 now i found my quote i'll okay. i'll let you finish on fortune so okay. this is chapter 15 sorry the things for which men and especially princes are praised or blamed the fact is that a man who wants to act virtuously in every way necessarily comes to grieve among so many who are not virtuous. Therefore, if a prince wants to maintain his rule, he must be prepared not to be virtuous and to make use of this or not according to need. Absolutely. Yeah, he is a, um, a utilitarian uh, before the word. Um, everything, oh. it's, it's all about um, results. And he wants to create these results, as I say, of this stability and this order. Um, and yeah. it, it's a yeah. whatever it takes. 
real politics, real politics. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but the, 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 what I found striking about the Bush years, for example, um, is that those were, on some level, crudely real politics, real, you know, real political, real, of real politics, but they were actually also, it, there, there's this strange uh, idealism in politics these days, right? We do we, everything that we do, of course, is highly model in the West, and we do everything just to save the planet and and bring democracy to everyone who does who doesn't have who's not enjoying a McDonald's and a Kentucky Fried Chicken yet. Um, so they all get sucked into that. But according to Machiavelli, whom they might have read, um, uh, the the consultants of of these governments is that there will, you know, great grief will come to them. But anyway, so. Well, yeah, this is, Machiavelli is all very aware of this, isn't he? He says, um, he says it's very important to be, to appear to be virtuous, <laughs> which is a nice way. Oh, okay, of, interesting, yeah. Okay. Saying, yeah, he says he, he um, I mean, he's not completely um, <laughs> ag against um, being, against these concepts of kindness and the Christian virtues and, and being religious as well. He says it's very important that one should be considered to be religious. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so so yeah. one should just be, it's just about public perception. It's about, yeah, appearances. And, but it, again, it's, it's completely utilitarian. One should appear to be a, um, a Christian and, and have the virtues simply because that will engender favor to you among the populace. And that, yeah, yeah. It, and that in turn will, again, uh, accrue to the stability and order of yeah, yeah. the republic. It's incredible that the the cold precision with with which he describes how to take countries, right, or different different principalities, like chapter three, composite principalities. Although there is some divergence in language, so between in France with Burgundy, Brittany, Gascony, Normandy, nonetheless their customs are similar, and they can easily get along together. So that's yeah. that's that's what matters: is order, stability, and and it's a, not chaos. But it and of course and to maintain that order, any means necessary are absolutely justified. Yeah, um, I think it might be not sound odd, but I think one of the best places to start for this book is right at the end. Um, okay, yeah, uh -huh. chap chapter twenty six. Um, Very good. Italy has, um, I'll paraphrase. Italy has been reduced to extremity, more ex more enslaved than the Hebrews, more oppressed than the Persians. <laughs> more scattered than the Athenians, without head, without order, beaten, uh -huh. spoiled, torn, overrun, and to have endured every kind of desolation. Yeah. So this is really the problem that Machiavelli is trying to solve throughout the book of The Prince, I think, and we might disagree on this. Mm -hmm. um, but this is where, this is one of the reasons I think Machiavelli is so badly misunderstood. Um, we treat Machiavelli as if he's, as if these, these rules that he's um, formulating, these principles that he's coming up with, are meant for everyone, um, you know, private citizens, um, you and me, but they're not, as, as you said at the beginning, they're intended specifically for this figure of the prince. Um, yeah. And it only, only, these principles are only formulated so that we can get rid of this extremity, um, get rid of this oppression, um, this scattering, um, this disorder, um and mm -hmm. so he's looking around he's a patriot of italy he wants to see it um restored to its former glory he's um he's pretty miserable at the state of things about how easily italy's being conquered and um and how really and he's and it's it's wrong to say he doesn't or in, in my opinion it's wrong to say he doesn't care about um the ordinary people of italy i think he deeply does um mm -hmm. he's he wants to see them prosper and you can only prosper and you can only have all this wonderful stuff like families and friendship and um, businesses and prosperity and art only you can have you can only have these things under conditions of order you can't have a michelangelo if um, the whole country is going to be invaded every 10 years mm -hmm. you need to create these conditions um, of stability so that all that nice stuff can happen and so this is why machiavelli's misunderstood um, these principles that he's coming up with, um, you know, the ends must be uh, reached by any means whatsoever, are not meant for you and me. They're meant specifically um, okay. for this leader. 
Okay, I think that's a good point. Maybe I'll try and summarize and rephrase this to, as analytics often say, to flash it out a bit more. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so, so what you're saying is it would be a misunderstanding to, because this book has become obviously a book that managers read, uh, right? And, and, and people who are you know, in business and want to act aggressively, like, as, just as they read Sun Tzu, The Art of War, uh, to go into their own private warfare um, in the in the business world, but you're saying this isn't just as a perhaps this was written for a prince and only for a prince to read, but that is not even significant. What's significant is that what he's describing is not simply for one man to take power and maintain power, but that this taking of power is a pragmatic, useful taking of power which serves the purpose of creating conditions of stability, order, and, and ultimately then good virtue. Uh, but there are certain things necessary, cr cruelty sometimes even, um, in order to get to that, but that's something that need not concern the public. But so his, his ultimate aim isn't, as sometimes perhaps is misunderstood, isn't just to argue for an absolutist or, or some sort of um, individual who takes power just to maintain power for himself, but to maintain power, yes, for himself, but as the sovereign, which makes the country, in that case, Italia, orderly. Yeah, and I think, um, in, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think every age reads, um, you know, the great books of history under its, own terms and i think that the, the modern interpretation of machiavelli it's, tells you more about modern modernism than it does about machiavelli yeah okay that's right? good yeah <laughs> i like i like that idea individual 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 don't we yeah um so um so we're reading so, the, as, so we read this as it uh, and trying to uh, um kind of um, acquire prosperity for ourselves yeah <laughs> When really, yeah. uh, Machiavelli's song is something very different. He's uh, he, he comes from a much more communitarian age, a much more patriotic age, um, an age when the country is a real coherent thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's that's that's uh, I think that's a very good point because what you're saying is, of course, under the the rule of neoliberalism, where what 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 it is is it's every individual for themselves, of course. Um, so everyone in the city of London or wherever they are, the Wall Street, the financial centers of the world, they read this book perhaps and and find, yeah, you, you can find uh, good advice in there, I, I, I would assume, on how to rule. But you only ever rule or come to power in that uh, respect then for yourself. But that's not what he's after. He's really after trying to... Um, bring Italy back to an old glory and trying to um, help or pr provide guidance and consultation to the Medici on how to, to do this and to, how to maintain order. He has a, an interesting quote here from Livy. Justum enim est bellum quibus necessarium et pia arma ubi nulla nisi in armis space est. And I'm reading from the translation because a necessary war is a just war and where there is hope only in arms, those arms are holy. Yeah. That's, that's something that's, you know, because to some degree we, we like to think we no longer wage war, but of course we do. It's kind of concealed our warfare and we would never quite put it like this. Right. So we, we do go to Iraq and, yeah, this is it's a little bit democracy, but it's it isn't it's, there's a war on terrorism which is invisible and you don't see it and it it's go, goes on forever. There's a war on drugs, uh, for example. But it's it's rarely said that there could be a war that's just and necessary. I find mm. maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, anyways, it was just it struck me that it's in there. Yeah, it's. I mean, there have it's, there have been obviously just wars in the twentieth century. I think the um, 
you know, the Second World War is the most obvious one. Um, there's disputes about whether the, it was necessary to go into the, the First World War. And obviously, um, things like Vietnam, um, Korea, um, first uh, Iraq and the second Iraq invasion, um, all disputed hotly whether they were in any way necessary. Obviously, there, I think there's a consensus that the Second World War um, for the Allies uh, was not necessary guarantee. And, and that was a just war, but yeah, they're I think few and far between recently. Um, yeah. And it obviously makes it a lot easier to, as you say, conceal that there is a war when we don't have things like, um, or when we have things like standing armies. Like before in the Vietnam era, there was a lot more yeah. um, well, well, public involvement in the Vietnam War because, um, because there was the draft, wasn't there? And so anyone could be uh, conscripted to go and and you also kind of yeah yeah and one also kind of knew who one was fighting for there's a chapter here on militias or in general on military organization and he says the obvious right if 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 you use militias that that you you can't trust them so um this is not something that that is sustainable and there's something else I find strong in chapter nine, that chapter in my translation is entitled The Constitutional Principality. Um, now, this perhaps just a view of, of how people come to power. A prince can never make himself safe against a hostile people. There are too many of them. He can make himself safe against the nobles who are few. So what he has to do is he has to pander a bit to the people, but not too much to the nobles. And it's interesting that he says here that the nobles have more foresight and they're more astute. They always act in time to safeguard their interests and they take sides with the one whom they expect to win. And also that the, the nobles are actually always about trying to keep the people down. It's very, it's like reading into uh, the depths of, of, of power relations here. Something that's very, not, not very often perhaps uh, considered is that in all polities, also in a democracy, that their power is at play and it will always be an ability. They might not have noble titles, but they, they might be perhaps um, some sort of a new elite, <laughs> wherever they might be. Um, and I'll tr- you will be found to have a yes. So what a prince has to do in order to build his own power on his people um, is someone who does not despair in adversity, who does not fail to take precautions, and who wins general allegiance by his personal qualities and the institutions he establishes. Then he will never be let down by the people, and he will be found to have established his power securely. So it is, it is not that it is a mistake to assume that if the people are in favor of someone in one election, shall we say, because you've been benevolent or have given them benefits, you cannot rely on that. But you have to take power with the sword almost and then initiate your own or build your own institutions and lead by example. Yeah, and um, that thing what you were saying about one not being able to depend on, um, you know, if if you have fortune at one, t- or if you have the favor of the people in one time, you might not have it in another time. He yeah. talks a lot in the end, and this, this goes back. Yeah, and this goes back to the fortune and ability comparison. He says yeah. a lot of a lot of leaders when things are going well, they they simply just enjoy themselves and and assume that if it was going well now, then if I just do the same thing. It'll, it'll always be this way. He says that, you know, he's a fool who doesn't shore up um, like corn during the good times so that he has something for the bad times. And yeah. one must always be alert and always be vigilant um, and always be preparing for things that might go wrong in the future. Um, and this is what he says, he's saying this about fortune. So he'll, the leaders who, who come to a bad end will say, oh, um, 
you know, I was doing all the right things and then fortune I, failed me and, um, and I lost, I, I lost uh, the favor of the people yeah. and came to a bad end. Well, Machiavelli will say, no, you, you were, it wasn't fortune, it was you. You were not preparing yourself um, for a downturn. You were not um, showing favor to the people when you could. You were not um, maybe showing favor to the nobles when you needed to do that. You, you simply did not work hard enough. Yeah. So there's something, this goes back to the, the opposition to the, the Christian outlook. Um, when something happens, it's not always providence. And so this is a very modern book um, in that sense. And this is, um, things, you know, our, 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 okay, yeah. our, um, our fate is in, is in our own hands. Uh, it's what he's saying there. Okay, that's, uh, uh, yeah. So in that sense, it's, it's a mo modern book because it's already, why? Because it's no longer relying on, on, on. Yeah, just to repeat what you just said. Actually, on God's providence. So you can't blame God. You have to blame yourself. And something else while you were talking struck me, um, which is because it's so. It's a prince. The prince is in charge. You, you, you said you have to prepare. You as the prince have to prepare, and if not, you will lose the favor of the people. But you also have to lead, as I said one has to lead by example and install one's institutions well. And that means it all flows from, from one end, but it has to be, someone has to be able to build, or provide structures and institutions in such a way that they can actually maintain order. He says about German cities that they are very you know, good because they can, they, they keep, um, um, they keep a year's supply of food, water, um, and, and whatever else is needed for livelihood for the public. And when we talked about, when you talked about the prince, I just thought for a minute, so the responsibility is on the prince and the prince is not a, a representative of some office, right? So the, it's not yeah. that you can just wait your turn of four or five years and then if something goes wrong you blame it on the office or maybe you have to step down yes but the prince loses everything if he loses everything he, he's usually kings are either you know killed <laughs> they're hung <laughs> or exiled if we're a bit yeah. nicer to them as the german emperors uh wilhelm that zweite wilhelm the second was exiled he wasn't he wasn't killed um but every other king that you hear of who, who doesn't do well usually hangs at some point right um so but that rarely happens of course which is very good that it doesn't happen anymore but um i'm just saying that the the, the onus is on the prince the full responsibility so that comes back to the point you made in the beginning or uh, uh, yeah to, i think it was in the beginning when you said this this isn't just about yourself and how you could improve your your power um or increase your power this is actually about how to maintain order and how then every means uh, is justified but it has to be for the greater public good shall we say. Mm. in order for there to be michelangelo <laughs> and not for in order for there to be whatever right maybe we want yeah. a michelangelo we want beauty <laughs> we want a, <laughs> we want rome and uh yes and the renaissance he's a renaissance figure isn't he yeah Obviously, Rinascimento. Yeah, in 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 large part because he, there is this. He's a, he's going back to uh, the ancients, right? He's going back to, he's looking back over the heads of of the great um, period of of the medieval period, back to Athens and back to Rome, um, and that's that's why maybe I quibble with you when you said this was this was always intended just to be read by one person. Yeah. Um, there's a bit where he writes, he's writing a letter to one of his friends and he, he, he describes uh, the way he works, the way he, um, he takes off um, the clothes of, of the town um, mm. all, with dust and mud and then puts on the, the courtly robes and kind of communes with the mind, the great minds of the ancient world and um, the great political figures of the ancient world. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, there's a way in which this book is a kind of a conversation with those great writers, um, uh, the Plato's, the Aristotle's, mm. um, 
I mean, the, the great Roman uh, Marcus Aurelius, the great um, Roman political writers, in which so this is very much, I think this was intended um, to be read kind of, um, maybe not by mm -hmm. other people, but by posterity, let's say. Um, and he wants, he wants this book to join kind of that great canon um, I think of political works. Okay. There's some other, yeah. Um, so that would mean that it, so it's, it's, it's perhaps written only for a few eyes for now, but it is written for posterity. Mm. And what I thought also is that what we usually call, refer to as Machiavellian, which is means usually taking power just for the sake of taking power, right? Mm is not appropriate yeah no reading of the book yeah, it turns out machiavelli <laughs> was, was not very was not actually machiavellian yeah, but yeah exactly that's that's always the problem right plato was not a platonist um <laughs> that that okay yeah so that makes sense it's it's not so, so machiavellian should actually mean taking power yes but in order to maintain order for the greater right. public good which, for example, translates into stable institutions and allow for, for example, beautiful architecture. Houses rather than housing. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that meme going around. I thought, Father, it was wonderful. I saw it on some social media somewhere. Um, okay. So, but, but he does have, you know, there are aspects where it, it is quite ruthless. You know? he, mm. So he points out in chapter... Sorry, this is chapter 11, no, 6. New principalities acquired by one's own arms and prowess. And there he says, that is why all armed prophets have, that is why all armed prophets have conquered and unarmed prophets have come to grief. Why? Um, because the armed prophet is well prepared and the unarmed prophet is not he relies on the people so the one who relies on the people's benevolence will always be less powerful than the one who just takes power right so that's perhaps the the more what we usually consider machiavellian So I'm just, but you would still say, obviously, even if someone takes power in that manner, for example, he speaks about prophets here. So he talks in this chapter, he talks, maybe I should have mentioned this. He talks about Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Tezois, but obviously Romulus, for example, very obviously founds Rome, <laughs> just the greatest empire of all times, right? Um, <laughs> which some people say uh, still exists on some level and obviously uh, still collapses on some other level. And so you, but so you, so, so even here, the armed prophet uh, needs to come to, so you, maybe you would, you would agree or maybe disagree. If I, if, if, if on your reading, what, what this means is the prophet who sees something great as for example, Romulus, the possibility of Rome, Right, of his own kingdom, even, even then one has to accept that one needs to be able to take power and be armed and be armed properly and not uh, deny that that's necessary. But even then, that's not Machiavellian in the usual sense because, even, because obviously Romulus did not just want to take power for himself but wanted to initiate Rome. Yeah, I mean, the, oh, the, point, the, the very simple point is the barbarians have arms, right? And <laughs> they are going to crush you. Well, yeah. Whatever it, they mean to crush you and to take over uh, Italy, just like they ended the Roman Empire. And so you don't bring a knife to a gunfight, right? You don't, and this is part of his, his opposition to the Christian virtues. Yeah. Right? That's all well and good, but it's ultimately it's decadent, right? This, and, and <laughs> Nietzsche's saying the same thing. It, it, it would all be lovely if, if we could just, if all we had to do was follow the Christian virtues. Yeah. But there's something important, there's people's lives at stake here. Okay, if you believe that, um, that yeah. order um, 
and something like the Roman Republic is better than than being uh, than the overrunning of Italy by the barbarians, yeah. then stand up and fight for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. But but he is but, but there is something he, I agree. But there is still something that's so he is he, he some of the things he suggests are just ruthless, right? For example, chapter five how cities or principalities which live under their own laws should be administered after being conquered. Um, so, uh, so he says in republics, for whatever reason, there is more life, more hatred, a greater desire for revenge. The memory of their ancient liberty does not and cannot let them rest. In their case, the surest way is to wipe them out or live there in person. <laughs> so yeah. he, has, he has these obvious moments where he says look if if there's some as for example Carthago uh Carthage, I don't know how to pronounce it in English um Carth oh, Carthage okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um yeah so so he said so that he'll wipe them out at least in my translation or he says in the same chapter whoever becomes the master of a city accustomed to freedom and does not destroy it may expect to be destroyed himself yeah, and, and again, this is maybe what I was, I'm too, what I'm I was saying. I'm steeped in Christian morality here myself, perhaps. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what I was saying about about this being an Aristotelian work, he is. This is yeah. political science. This isn't. He's not a moralist. Um, he's not uh, a moral philosopher. He is telling you what he has learned from the study of history. Yeah. If you do X, then Y will happen, and that's simply he's quite dispassionately telling you what what history tells us will happen when you do certain things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's always the utilitarianism. It's always, if I do X bad, then I believe that Y good will happen and that yeah, the good yeah. is better than the bad. Yeah. Uh, or more severe than the bad or, uh, or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's all about, again, I get back to this, this, what I, raised earlier about this about yeah. vices appearing to be or virtues appearing to be vices and vices appearing to be virtues so chapter 15 is is a good kind of condescension um condensation of that point um it says, a, prince, a prince need not make himself uneasy at incurring a reproach for those vices without which the state can only be saved with difficulty so he's talking about really the saving of a state this is really uh, in extremis if everything is considered carefully, it will, it will be found that something which looks like virtue, if followed, mm -hmm. would be his ruin, mm -hmm. and by, by extension, the, the state's ruin. Um, while something else which looks like vice, yet followed, brings him security and prosperity, and I would say by extension, security and prosperity of the Republic. So yeah. it's, it's the, the slogan is desperate times call for desperate measures. All right, this is, and this is, uh, I, I've said Nietzsche is a good person to read alongside. Hobbes is another person who's much more uh, contemporary. Um, he, he's, he's much, he's, he's also uh, quite close to Machiavelli. Hobbes advocates an absolute monarchy. Yeah. Um, that, that's going to involve a whole lot of things which um, our modern liberal minds kind of revolt at. Um, yeah. But he's, he's talking about stopping a civil war he's just lived through this civil war which modern um minds can't fathom the horrors of waking up every day and thinking that this will be it we're gonna be overrun this is death this is plague and so a neighboring city state. yes um and it's in it, Florence, for example were arch enemies and they're not really far apart yes and 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 hobbes is quite quite a good psychologist in this he talks about um the civil, what civil war does to people's minds as well he was kind of ahead of his time in this just mm. um it's one thing when you're you, you feel you might be uh, invaded by a foreign army but you can see you can see them coming on you and you and you're kind of your collective um at least you have each other in your own country yeah the civil war is just a whole order of magnitude worse because it's just you're you're suspicious of your neighbor you're suspicious all the time you're never at peace you're never secure um and that's that's a kind of horror that he thinks um requires desperate measures um to uh, to to fend off hops or machiavelli 
uh, Machiavelli, uh, Hobbes, sorry. Hobbes, yeah. yeah. But ju just very briefly on Hobbes, um, Hobbes will have, I think, has very much a much stronger. First of all, he wrote a lot more. He's also got a, almost a perfect materialist system. So he's got very different commitments in terms of maybe metaphysics or ontology and perhaps Machiavelli, but that's just an, as a maybe unimportant aside. In terms of Nietzsche, one thing I wanted to say that we could, I would understand this book as a case in point for an, a, a monumental way of writing history. So Nietzsche has this distinction in the use and abuse of history for life, where he distinguishes between antiquarian, monumental, and critical historians. Critical historians are maybe perhaps what we're living through right now, where everything that was in the past necessarily was wrong, which is it's highly moralistic, right? Everything of earlier days was wrong. We are the pinnacle of reason and truth. Perhaps that's the remnant of um, the, the dying enlightenment movement that we, you know, we're progressing every year, therefore any year past this must have been terrible. And so that's a critical, you can only look back, the critical historian can only look back and look at the world and, and the past and say, oh God, they were so wrong. Oh, terrible, we, we must tear down everything they've done. And the, the antiquarian is someone who's a, like a bookkeeper, he keeps details and taps on everything, knows every single, year when something might have happened and who did what but it doesn't come together and the monumental historian is someone who takes the examples and doesn't really care too much about details and fact facticity and all the factuality i mean but brings it all into one form and that form then informs and brings about something that no one else perhaps in that way had seen before but also lets the prince in this in this in this uh, case live in a different way, or yeah, you know, to be monumental means to be connected with the past on a different level than just the antiquarian. For the antiquarian, it's just something of the past. For the monumental historian or thinker, it's something that's still breathing. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's. And so he says something in, um, in chapter six, uh, a wise man ought always to follow the paths beaten by great men. Huh. This is kind of what you're saying, isn't it? And to imitate those who have been supreme so that his ability does not equal theirs. Uh -huh. uh, at least it will savor of it. Um, and then there's another Aristotelian bit, uh, let him act like the clever archers who, designing to hit the mark which yet appears too far distant and knowing the limits to which the strength of their bow attains, take aim at a much higher mark not to reach by their strength or their arrow to so great a height, but to be able to, but to be able with the aid of so high an aim to hit the mark they wish to reach. Yeah. So like the archer, again, that just rings alarm bells for Aristotle for me. Um, but it's, it's also, a, it's the great, it's the great man view of history. All right. Isn't it? Um, one should, it's the genius view. It's the, it's the view that history um, is shaped by great individuals and yeah. not, the yep. um, mm -hmm. opposing modern view that history is shaped really by these underlying events that we can't really see and, and individuals really have little to do with it. So that's the modern view. The, yeah. So, so, sorry. So you would, so the modern view would be that it's structured. That it's, yeah, no. that it's underlying structures and, event, and, and uh, events. Mm -hmm. the, the, the older view is the, the great man view of history, which is like the 19th century Thomas Carlyle. Oh, by um, modern, okay, sorry, by modern you mean contemporary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because right. modern... <laughs> yeah, it's a modern, modern, Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the contemporary view. Um, yeah, but that's... Yeah, it. it's, it's going back to this, going back to this Aristotelian view, right, in which the way you are good is to follow the example of good uh, individuals. And this is why Aristotle says, you know, having... Uh, good models, uh, good teachers is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's what Machiavelli is saying here. That's what Nietzsche will say uh, later. Um, so, yes. So it, it's a humanist view of history, the human being at the center. And then, of course, some human beings 
higher, more important than others. It's the individual, the sovereign individual who makes history rather than the postmodern or even Heideggerian view where history is events and is structural and human beings are in, is responding to something. Um, okay. Yeah, that, that makes, that makes perfect sense, which is why he also, of course, focuses on the prince and the prophet, right? There's almost no distinction made between prince and prophet. I guess for him, the, the absolute optimum of a, of a prince is also a prophet, is, is Moses, is Romulus, is Theseus, or is Cyrus, who all acquired and founded kingdoms. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, they don't have necessarily have to be that, that great. He talks at the end of the book about um, Ferdinand, Ferdinand of Spain, who's, uh, who came from almost obscurity to, to, to unify Spain, um, to expel various forces that were um, invidious to Spain, and uh, he's done a great job. So he, he's, he's, not, um, he's not saying this is impossible and that these people come along once every you know, thousand years. This is very doable. Um, it's just unfortunate for Machiavelli that the person he wrote it to died about five years later and um, was unable to do anything um, with it. But yeah, this isn't an impossible ask that he's he's making. That um, but still, still it requires um, you know a great man, um, maybe not a genius, but certainly a great person who's who has this ability, this virtue, this force of character to seize history himself and not simply yeah. uh, recline and and it it yeah. is it is the strong individual. So the fortune, so he says here, fortune as it were provided the matter, but they, meaning Moses and Romulus and Cyrus, gave it, gave fortune its form. Without mm -hmm. opportunity, their prowess would have been extinguished, yes. And without such prowess, the opportunity would have come in vain. But so it needs the strong individual who, well, as Nietzsche says, the, the, the blonde beast or something, who makes fortune his own who gives it form so it's moses who had to find the israelites in my translations the hebrews the jews in in servitude and then free them that was actually his fortune <laughs> so he become he became moses yeah and he's he's but, saying uh, at the end, um, cometh, uh, cometh. Oh, there's a, a phrase, cometh the age, cometh the man, or cometh the hour, cometh the man, in which uh, events are so, um, or in which situations are so um, formed that they call forth a, a great, a great hero, a great actor to step up um, and seize the moment. And he's saying that's what Moses did, that's what all these great figures did, mm -hmm. and that's why he's saying it. The that's why. This is probably rhetorical at the end that Italy is in such a bad shape, the way it's been reduced to extremity, more enslaved than the Hebrews, more oppressed than the Persians, etc. He's saying that the time is ripe. Okay, the yeah. conditions are here. This is as bad for the Italians <laughs> as it was um, for the yeah. Jews in Egypt. Okay, there's cometh the, the man. This is, is what he's saying. But actually, to your point, and I think I said this already, but maybe just to stress it again a bit, is when he. You know, Giving the fact that he gives the example of Moses, obviously, obviously not someone who takes power just for the sake of his own power, but in order to free his people. That's a good point. Yeah. And, 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 and even more than just that, not just freeing from slavery, which is magnificent in his own way, but also to lead them. And that's, of course, the tragedy of, of maybe the, of Israel itself is you know, bring them home. And that total, totally isn't about just power. Yeah, no, that's right. So it's about um, so the we've now cracked the nut. When people say Machiavelli, and they get it all wrong. Yeah. So you must listen to the classical philosophy podcast. <laughs> Definitely. If not, you 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 know you lose wrong categories for the rest of your life. And and listen to our podcast on Thus Spake Zarathustra to get um, more context on what we've been talking about. I think that we've had have agreed already that we should talk on uh, we should do another one on Nietzsche so we yeah. will 
I was just thinking, we'll, we'll talk about which one, but we'll do that in the coming month or so. Um, so yeah, is there anything more that we should add for now? Or have we kind of put the world to rights? And... I think so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> enough, for, enough for this week. <laughs> enough for this week and yeah, more truth, truth next, next, next week. So thanks very much for listening, everyone. Please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and support us on Patreon. Thank you very much.